Mortgage Brokers Act. Now, this is a very crucial chapter for my mortgage students. You will be tested on a lot of information out of this chapter. They will be talking about what is a Mortgage Brokers Act or who is responsible for your registration or what are the rules? What are the forms that you have to use? There's just so much information out of this chapter that you need to know for the exams. Are you guys excited? I am. This is going to be a good one. <laughs> Open your notes and let's begin. So the first thing we have to talk about is what is a Mortgage Brokers Act? On exam, they call it the Mortgage Brokers Act and regulations, or sometimes, or well, most of the time, they will call it the Act. And that's it. So when they say a mortgage brokers act or the act, it means exactly the same thing. Now, my question to you, this act itself, it's all of the rules, regulations that you as a mortgage broker have to abide by. You have to go by the rules. And if you breach the rules, then you can lose your license. So this rules and regulations that we have based on this mortgage brokers act, are they applicable to all of the provinces of Canada or the or every single province have different rules and regulations? What do you think? So provinces, do they all have the same rules or they all have different rules and regulations? Okay, let me ask another question. Licensing system. In order for you to get licensed in British Columbia, is it the same system that will be in, let's say, in Ontario or Saskatchewan? It's different right? because each province decide how do you want to get your license, right? What are the rules and what are the regulations? So now you get the answer. So if I ask you this Mortgage Brokers Act and regulations, is that a provincial or is that a federal legislation that controls you? <laughs> then you'd better say it's a provincial one. So on the exam, they like to test you on this. Just know that it's not federal. It's not all provinces are the same. They might be alike, but they're not the same. So all the rules and regulations, each province decides on their own, right? So that is why it says it's provincial legislation that regulates the conduct of the mortgage profession in British Columbia, right? So provincial act. So this is all those rules and regulations. Who do you think they're trying to protect here with all those rules and regulation? Is that for your protection or is that for the public protection? To know the rule is that it's never about you. Nobody wants to protect you. Nobody cares about you. I do care about you, but I don't think they do because <laughs> all the laws and everything else is kind of not against you, but it's for the protection of the public, right? Make sure that you as a profession don't hurt the public. Don't take advantage of the public in any way, shape or form. And for that reason, the act, right? Um, come up with the boss for you. And his name is Register. We're going to talk about him very soon. But just know that, yes, the boss is the one that will enforce the act on you. He's the one that says, hey, you'd better abide by the rules, right? Otherwise, you know, the slop coming, <laughs> right? Uh, also, the act, make sure that you guys are licensed, right? Make sure that you went through the licensing requirements, whatever they need to do, right? And appropriate conduct of the course of the business. So make sure that you know what you're doing when it comes to your business. Um, licensing system. So what happens... How do you get licensed and like, what do we do? Licensing system is pretty basic, right? So we have a mortgage broker and then we have a sub mortgage broker. In real life, after you pass the exam and after you um, can start working, you will be calling yourself a mortgage broker. That's just how it is. Everybody calls themselves mortgage brokers. But for the exam purposes, they say the mortgage broker is the actual office that you're working for. As an example, Dominion Lending is one of them, right? It's an umbrella for you. When I say an umbrella, that means they will protect you from the rain. They will protect you from complaints. They will try to protect you from things because they will be educating you. They will be helping you with your business. You're not working for them nine to five. It's not like you're obligated. It's not like you have a boss on top of you, but the mortgage broker will be your brokerage. It's, it's the place that you're going to hang your license with, right? And if you don't like them for some reason, can you switch them? It's like any other relationships, right? If you don't like one, guess what? Move on. <laughs> you can always switch them up if you wanted to, but the mortgage broker, think of it as your, as your office for the exam purposes, and you will be a sub mortgage broker you're underneath them you're a sub mortgage broker you have the same 
rights to to help your clients and everything else you have the same things but it's just the way they call you based on UBC books as a sub mortgage broker now we're going to talk about you first and then we'll come back and talk about the a mortgage broker so as a sub mortgage broker when you fill up your application form you will put your personal name on that application form uh, and when I say personal name, that means you can't come up with anything else, right? So you cannot use your corporation. Let's say you already have one, or if you have a partnership, you can't do that. You can only be as an individual as a sub mortgage broker. And when the brokerage pays you, they have to pay to you as an individual only, not the corporation, not the holding company, nothing else. Right? So that's kind of the rule, right? It must be employed by your mortgage broker so what they're trying to say that you cannot be independent at all like i mean yes you got in this job to be independent but yes you need to have an umbrella on top of you so you cannot work without the brokerage sometimes they call it sponsored by the mortgage broker nobody's gonna sponsor you i mean nobody's gonna pay you to be part of them uh, usually it's opposite you will be paying some type of fees to your mortgage broker to be underneath them uh, to use their name and use their firm uh, their office, but for the exam, they say must be employed or must be sponsored by the mortgage broker. That means you have to be part of that mortgage broker. Okay, that's that's what they're trying to say. Now, what if you don't like them? As I said before, it's like relationship, right? Then what do you do? You switch. You move to the next one. But what happens if you quit with this one? Let's say you 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 got into with Dominion Lending and you don't like the way they operate, you don't like the way they train you, and you say you know what, not a good fit. You quit. And then you're looking for another brokerage. And while you're looking for another brokerage, what happens to your license then? Your license will be suspended, okay? So the easiest way for you to switch between the brokerage, you find a new one first, <laughs> right? And then you transfer your license. So this way you don't have a gap in between, and this way you don't have that suspension of your license in between. Because if you have a transaction going on, then, then that transaction will be suspended too, right? Not good. So just understand that you always have to be part of the active brokerage. You always have to be part of some type of umbrella. Okay, you need to be under that umbrella. You have to make sure that you're suitable for the registration. So that means you have to pass your exam. <laughs> nice and simple. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if it's a mortgage broker or the sub mortgage broker, your license renewal will be every two years. Right? That's what that is. No more exams. You don't have to see me again. Uh, you don't have to go back to UBC for your course, but every two years you will have to pay the fee to keep your license going. And with that fee, it usually comes with some educational courses because they want to make sure that you're up to date on all of the relevant information that the Act came up with or British Columbia came up with, right? So that's what the, every two years is your registration you have to renew. And it's the same applies to, the, to your office, to your mortgage broker. So mortgage broker could be not just an individual, it could be a sole proprietorship, which is individual, co corporation, right, or the partnership. So that means they can register themselves as whatever they like to be, right? So that's the benefit of this. But you cannot be a mortgage broker. You cannot open your own office yet, okay? After two years, we'll get to that part, you'll be able to create your own mortgage broker company, right? And then you can put that as a corporation or partnership or whatever you like to have. So we'll get to that part soon, not yet. Okay, so we're going to do two questions now about the, um, I want to see who do you think that is, right? Question number one, an individual who does any or all of the things that the mortgage broker does and is employed by a mortgage broker or is a director or a partner of the mortgage broker, I'm going to explain you that part soon, is known under the Mortgage Brokers Act as who, okay? What would be the keyword in this question? What would you choose as a keyword? Employed by. So if somebody says employed by, that has to be a mortgage broker, right? Because without that employment, you cannot work. You cannot have your license. Question number two. Bob, a mortgage broker, hires Sally to work for him as a sub-mortgage broker. Okay, so Sally is a sub-mortgage broker. And what matters to me in this case is it's, it's Sally, okay? Because Bob, if he's a mortgage broker, he can be anything. He can be a corporation, right? What else? He can be an individual. He can be a 
holding company, it could be a partnership, whatever he wants to do. But Sally is a sub-mortgage broker and she only can be as who? Only as individual. Good job. So it says, which of the following arrangement would be in compliance with Section 21 of the Mortgage Brokers Act? Now, all those sections, numbers, you don't have to worry about, okay? They'll just add them in there, but it, it doesn't do anything to the question itself. So don't worry about the sections, okay? Mortgage Brokers Act. Which one is in compliance? Which one is a true statement? Which one she can be, basically? Okay, so Bob, it says, through Bob Financial Group, a corporation, so he's a corporation, pays Sally commission to Sally's mortgage corporation. Now, Sally pays to Sally's corporation. Can Sally be a corporation? She's a sub-mortgage broker, and that means she has to be only registered as an individual. Good job. So for that reason, that's a false statement. She cannot be a corporation. Option two, Bob is a sole proprietor. Put Sally's commission to Sally's as the individual. Now, that's definitely a true statement. Option four doesn't say all of the above, so should, that should be the answer, but let's look at the other ones. Three, Bob, through Bob's Financial Group, a corporation, pay Sally commissions to Sally's spouse, Sean. Can you pay uh, to a spouse? Can you pay to a daughter? She said, you know what? I don't want to have more income under my personal name, so just pay to my husband's name. Definitely not possible, <laughs> right? So that's not good. And then the last one, Bob, through Bob's and Associates as a partnership, pays Sally's commission to Sally's mortgage company, LTD. LTD is limited company, which is corporation again, and that's not possible. So the only option that you can choose here, always watch for that sub-mortgage broker because he can only have himself as an individual. Okay? Pretty simple stuff. Good job. Okay, so mortgage broker. So we talked about that your office, your brokerage is a mortgage broker. Right? So that's one of the definitions. But mortgage broker definition is a very broad definition. There's a lot of other people that should be a mortgage broker. And we're going to talk about them right now. So you hold yourself as, or by the advertisement, uh, if you put the sign on your lot and says, uh, mortgage broker service is provided here. As soon as you say that, you have to have a mortgage broker license crazy right so you know if you just put a sign in there and if he says mortgage broker services provided that's it <laughs> and if you don't have that i'll tell you what will happen to you okay so if you do that you have to have a license if in any one year you receive for more than a thousand dollars in fees for providing the services so if you helping somebody with mortgages and if you get the fee for more than a thousand bucks in one year then you'd better have your license. You'd better have a mortgage broker license. Next one, during one year, lends money to the security of 10 or more mortgages. So if you have a wealthy friend who is not sure what to do with his money, if he wants to lend money to your clients, he can do that. But if it's more than 10 transactions, then he'd better have his license. So he needs to get the, the same course as what you do right now. Right? If not, he's going to get in trouble. But if it's less than 10, then that's, he'll, he'll be okay. If somebody cares in the business of lending money, secured of the whole or part of the mortgages, whether money is in the mortgage broker's own or another person, so if you're helping somebody, if it's your own money, if you're lending money, secured as a whole or part, you'd better have your mortgage license and carries on the business of collecting money secured by the mortgages. So if you, again, collecting money as a mortgage, that means you'd better have your license and carries on the business of buying and selling mortgages or the agreement for sale. So if you're buying and selling mortgages, you consider to be as a mortgage broker and you have to have your license. An agreement for sale is something that we'll teach you in the next chapters coming up, a bit more farther. <laughs> but it's basically a, um, if it's a seller who gives the mortgage to the borrower and says, look, I'll give it to you but you'll give me an installment towards the mortgage payments as a borrower and only when you pay off the mortgage in full i'll transfer the title under your name okay so that's called the agreement for sale we'll talk about later chapters not now but just know if somebody helps somebody to buy or sell those type of mortgages then they consider to be as a mortgage broker and they have to be licensed they have to go through this ubc exam and pass the exam and get the license 
If any of those people that advertise themselves, buy and sell mortgage, collecting money, secured by the mortgages, if they do any of that stuff without the license, they will be fined. And the fine is crazy. A hundred thousand dollars fine or, or, and two years of imprisonment so they can put you in prison if you do any of that stuff and if you don't have a mortgage license now they don't test you on that information on the exam so you don't have to worry about that hundred thousand fine <laughs> or two years imprisonment but just know that this is a serious thing so don't just put a sign in front of your yard if you're not if you don't have a mortgage license don't do that <laughs> So what are the exemptions? Who do, do, this is the people or this is the entities don't need to have a mortgage license. They, they will be fully exempt, okay? So who is the fully exempt ones? First thing comes up to you has to be government, okay? So any government jobs, employees, or whatever they do in their government business, um, lending money, helping people, whatever that is they do, I don't know. They will be fully exempt. Government doesn't need a license. Okay, next one, insurers licensed under the FIA, in the Financial Institution Act. You don't have to know about this one yet. But insurance, banks, credit unions, trust companies, they will be fully exempt. Now, this is good information up front because I still have students who are confused. They pass the exam and then they call the office and they say, so can I just work for CIBC? Can I work for one specific bank? And my people always shake their heads like, why did you take this course then? Because you as a mortgage broker, what is your job? Is to work with all of the lenders, okay? Do you know that most borrowers, 60% uh, of the borrowers go through the mortgage brokers and not the banks now? Why? Because they know, first of all, you guys don't charge them fee to help them out, okay? It's the lenders who pay you fees for your services. And the second of all, you work with all of the lenders to find the best deal for your clients. Okay, if, if a client goes just to one specific bank, that person that works at that bank, they cannot say, oh, but the other bank has a better rate than us. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They only can tell you what they have. And that's why people prefer to go to mortgage people and say, look, you're so much better because you're working with all of the lenders at once and you gonna, you know, find me the best deal down there. But if you're planning to work for just one specific bank, then you don't need to have this license. Stop with this course, <laughs> right? Don't do this course because what happens at the bank, they just hire you if they hire you, right? And then they will give you their own training to you. And then you can only tell the clients about their, like the bank that you're working for, about their rates and everything else, but you can never help your clients with the other lenders, right? Cause that will be a conflict of interest in there. So banks, will be exempt. They don't need to have this license with so people that are working for the banks, credit unions, trust companies, people acting for the, on behalf of the government. Okay. Government is exempt. A trustee in bankruptcy or you know, liquidator. So anybody that doing transactions during the bankruptcy there, they don't need to have a mortgage license, a lawyer in the course of his business, right? So if that's part of his business, then he's okay. Okay. Anyone acting under the authority of the court, so if the court authorizes somebody to do something, then then we'll be fine. Uh, no, no need for license. Personal lending money on land to provide housing for the employees. That's towards government jobs, not personal. Okay. And one interesting exemption will be for the realtors. Okay. So the realtors, we had, uh, I'm trying to remember the year 2004, 2009, uh, where... No, it was before that, sorry. In 1990, I think it was, sorry, it was before 2000. So when you get your license um, before 2000, then people who got their real estate license, they also got a mortgage license at the same time. So they got the same package, right? Yeah, it happened before 2000. So those agents could do a real estate transaction and they could do the mortgage transaction. Okay, but now we don't have that. Now you, this is where you take your mortgage license first. And if you want to do real estate license after, you still can do that, right? To have both of them, but you'll have to go through two different exams. But the point is, if you are the real estate, real estate agent and your client uh, needs, uh, your client is a seller who wants to give a mortgage to the buyer. Okay, it's called a vendor take back mortgage. So it's the seller who provides the mortgage instead of the bank uh, to the borrower. And then if you involved as a realtor in that transaction, 
Do you, then you're allowed to facilitate it without the mortgage license. So that's what they're trying to say in here. It still has one of the exemptions left about those real estate agents that they allowed to help people with the event they take back mortgages only, nothing else, okay? So one question, do you need to have a mortgage license? In regards to the activity of engaging in the business of soliciting borrowers uh, for the purpose of the mortgage referrals or registration, okay? Read it again if you need to. In regards to the activity of engaging of the business of the soliciting those. So basically, if somebody does the cold calling for you, like it's not you, but it's somebody else who does the cold calling for you, do they need to have a mortgage license? And those people usually when they do a cold calling, do they give information about mortgages or anything like this? No, they collect the information, the names, phone numbers, and that's pretty much it. As long as it's nice and short, right? They don't get any information from people from the, or they don't give your, inf like they might exchange the names for you and the phone numbers for you and that's okay. For that reason, they will be exempt and they also don't have to have a license, right? So just know that some of the soliciting in this case don't need to have a license. Okay, real question, question number three, which of the following um, professionals uh, does not fall within the definition of the mortgage brokers provided by the British Columbia Mortgage Brokers Act. So who do not fall into that definition, okay? Who don't need to have a license, a mortgage license. Let's look at four options. The owner of the nightclub who uh, supplements his income by lending money to the security of the mortgages. And in the last year, he made seven of those uh, separate mortgages. So he has extra money, he wants to lend them, he lends to seven people, seven different mortgages. Does he need to have a mortgage license right now? Or oh, is he okay for now? <laughs> He's gonna be okay for now until what? Until he reaches out to 10 transactions. Remember that? Okay, so for that reason, he will be fully exempt at this point. So it says, does not fully, so he's not, a so that should be the answer at this point because he is, um, not there yet, do you see what I mean, right? But let's read the other options just to make sure that we understand why the, all the other options need to have a mortgage license. An individual who lends money secured in part by mortgages in British Columbia on behalf of the wealthy oil tycoon and who earns the commission exceeding the 3,000 per year. What do we say about the, go back on your notes, go back. Look back at your notes, what do, what do we say about the commissions? If you receive more than 1,000 per year, then you have to have your mortgage license, right? So you'll consider to be as a mortgage broker. This guy receives 3,000, he's definitely uh, need to get his mortgage license, otherwise he's gonna be penalized. Remember how much penalty? 100,000 <laughs> or two years in prison or both. Okay, so we don't want that. Number three, a real estate broker who has a sign outside of his office saying that he's providing mortgage broker services, but whose practice does not include any involvement money left uh, lend on the security of the mortgages. So he's basically put the sign in front of his house as mortgage services provided, but he doesn't actually do it himself. Guess what? He's in trouble if he doesn't have a license. So he needs to have his mortgage license because he's already considered to be as a mortgage broker. Okay, good job. And the last one, an individual who makes her living buying and selling agreements for sale. Remember, buying and selling mortgages, agreement for sales, then you consider to be as a mortgage broker, you have to have your license. Good job. Question four, which of the following people would not be specifically exempt from the current registration requirement of the mortgage brokers act? So who is not exempt? Okay, who, who is not on that exempt, exempt list? Okay, look at the first one, Sasha. A mortgage loan officer at one of the banks uh, listed on the Banks Act of Canada. So he works for the bank. Does he have to have a mortgage license? Nope, okay. So he doesn't need to have a license, so who will not be specifically exempt from the current. You see, make sure that you read the question properly. Make sure that you know what they're looking for, okay? Who is not exempt. So he is exempt because he doesn't need to. So he's not, he's not the answer because they ask you who is not exempt, okay? Who needs to have a license, basically. That's what they're asking for. So he doesn't need to have a license because he works for one specific bank, okay? Not him. Next one, Jim is a criminal lawyer, okay? And he helps his clients out. Uh, he helps his clients 
out when in need by lending the money on the security of the property he's collecting nineteen thousand dollars this year so far okay criminal lawyer who helps his clients when they need money for the mortgages and he already gets nineteen thousand in fees from those clients question mark let's keep this one for now <laughs> next one anna Real estate agent licensee who is fastly uh, helping the sale of the vendor take back mortgage for the clients during, uh, during the course of one of her real estate transactions. Remember, that's one of the exemptions for sure. She will be fully exempt because she's dealing with a vendor take back mortgage. She's helping that seller with that mortgage. And that's on the exemption list. So she's out. Sasha is out. Joanna is an employee of the Ministry of the Finance of British Columbia. She's working for the government. Okay. Um, and ministry lends money to low-income households of the security land. So government is also exempt. So lawyer is the only ones left. But why? Look back at your list again. What does it say on the list? It says a lawyer in the course of his practice. Do you see that word practice? What practice is, his, is this lawyer? He's practicing in criminal law. So lending money it's not part of his practice do you see what i mean by this so it's very tricky so watch out how they say things in there for you and that's not his practice uh, of expertise right lending people money his practice is dealing with criminal stuff so for that reason he is not exempt and he needs to have his mortgage license true or false question five a trustee in bankruptcy does not have to be registered under the mortgage brokers act is trustee in bankruptcy, is he part of that exemption list? Yes, he is. Okay, so that is a true statement. He is right on that list of the exemptions. Right? So liquidators, uh, trustee in bankruptcy, they don't need to have a mortgage broker license. Okay, This one, true, false. Real estate licensee are prohibited under the Mortgage Brokers Act from arranging the vendor take back mortgages um, on their client's transaction. Are they prohibited or they can't do this? Remember, exemption, yes, they can do that. So for that reason, that's a false statement. They're not prohibited, okay? So we talked about you as a sub-mortgage broker, right? So you will be working as a person. You're going to put that registration under your personal name, and you're going to be personally responsible for things. But what happens if, let's say, after two years, you say, you know what? I want to open my own brokerage. Can you do this? Yes, you can. So you're allowed to have your own brokerage, but yes, you need to have those two years of license experience. And in those two years, you should not be uh, getting in trouble <laughs> from, the, from your um, boss or from anybody else. Right? You have to have a clean business for two years. And then if you decide to have your own brokerage, you can do this. And what every single mortgage broker's brokerage needs to have is they must have a registered sub-mortgage broker who acts as a designated individual. So this designation that we call a DI, designated individual, it's usually going to be you. So if you open your own brokerage and um, you can open that brokerage again as a corporation, as a holding company or whatever you want, the, the um, partnership, right? But then you have to put yourself or somebody who has a two years of experience uh, also as a designated agent uh, to, to, um, to watch over your brokerage. And that's exactly what they do. So I'll show you. So DI, designated individual, could be a corporation, could be, um, they can put itself whatever they want, partnership, sole proprietorship. They're responsible to ensure that, um, they, they ensure in the proper supervision, right, registration and record keeping of your brokerage. That's kind of the whole idea. They want to supervise all the sub-mortgage broker people, make sure that they don't make any mistakes, because if the sub-mortgage brokers made mistakes or they get sued for something, designated agent will be also on the hook he'll be responsible for his own people right so must be registered within minimum of two years without having any record of regulatory compliance um, problems within the act or any other legislation in bc or elsewhere can you highlight the word elsewhere okay so what they're trying to say that yes if you want to become or open your own mortgage broker or become a designated agent for that mortgage broker office then you'd better be not in trouble and not just in bc but anywhere else okay that's what they want to hear from you and if you're okay with that then you can become a designated individual 
of the brokerage. All must have the two years experience managing the business of the specific mortgage broker entity on which person intends to act as a designated agent. So if you manage somebody else's office as a designated individual, and so that's also good. You can hire somebody too. You don't have to do it yourself. That's what they're trying to say. Are you responsible for um, any actions of your sub-mortgage people working for you? Yes, you are. So if they are in trouble, that means you are in trouble as a designated individual too, right? So key duties are, so if you talk about what is the key duty of the DI, of course, is the supervision, right? Your job is to supervise the whole office, make sure that they don't make those mistakes because otherwise you will be going to courts and dealing with your boss all the time, right? right? Supervise the activities of all of the sub-mortgage brokers. Come on. True or false? Question number seven. Uh, DI must be recently registered as a mortgage broker in British Columbia for a minimum of two years with no record of regulatory compliance issues. Now, this is a tricky, tricky statement, and I'll pause for a sec. Read it again and tell me if that's true or false. So true or false? And guess what? Most of you guys will say it's true, but it's not true. It's false statement. <laughs> Why? Why is it false still? Minimum of two years with no record of, you know, like no issues. And it, what's the problem? The problem is here. It says in British Columbia. Isn't that crazy? Because it says it's not only British Columbia, but it's also in every single province in Canada, right? That's kind of where it's, it's so tricky. I can't believe they did that to you, but now you know what to look for, okay? Okay, so what is his responsibility as DI? Responsibility is to make sure that all of the people that are working for you, they are all registered, right? Nobody's license is expired. Make sure that year to end financial filings is up to date, right? Ensure all of the books and records um, are accurate and up-to-date again. Ensure all of your employees are registered under the Mortgage Brokers Act. Right? Oh, sorry, the first one was the registration application. Make sure you help them or manage the applications for your people, sub-mortgage people. Employees are registered under the Mortgage Brokers Act, and then they are properly supervised and make sure that they are up-to-date on all of the relevant information. Okay? Common sense, that's kind of what you're doing. Think of yourself as now you have your own business and you're responsible for all of the people that are working underneath you. Question eight. So which of the following are requirements imposed on the designated individual um, of the corporate brokerage by the Mortgage Brokers Act regulation? Now, if I go too fast for you, guess what you do? You pause me, <laughs> okay? I do speak fast. Uh, there's a lot of information in here, but you can always pause me, okay? So what do they ask you again? Following requirements imposed on the diagnosis. So what's his job is? Look at option A. Must ensure that all books and records of the mortgage broker are accurate and up-to-date. Common sense, sounds good to me, okay? Option two is L because it doesn't have an A. Option B, DI must make sure that all of the um, appropriate employees are registered under the Mortgage Brokers Act. Yes, that's a rule that has to happen. Okay, and then next one, D must make sure that all of the employees, uh, the brokerage are kept informed of all of the relevant mortgage brokers legislation and regulations. Sounds like a common sense. And the last one, DI must issue an annual report to the employees of the brokerage detailing the brokerage financial status. What? Do you have to tell your people, your employees, how much money you made this year? <laughs> right? I don't think so. So definitely not option D. It definitely doesn't make any sense, but everything else in here, right? Books up to date, employees are registered, right? All that stuff has to be happened, except you definitely don't have to let them know how much What's your annual report? How much money you made? <laughs> Not their business. Okay, so can you hire somebody who is unlicensed? So can mortgage brokers employ assistants who are not registered? Can you do such a thing, yes or no? Please say yes, because you will need help. <laughs> 
Everybody needs help at some point and you will see how many of our students are coming from those unlicensed assistants and now they want to get registered, right? Because you'll see how limited those people are. So if you become an unlicensed assistant um, of a mortgage broker, you will be very limited of what you can do um, for that mortgage broker, right? So think of it this way. Think of the assistant who cannot, think of it as zipper here, okay? They cannot advise, they cannot um, oversee document, they cannot review the document, they cannot do nothing. They cannot talk to the clients or the lenders. They just dare to do a few things, okay? And those few things are usually, they'll order certain documents or send or, um, and accept a certain documentation between the registered broker and the broker. So basically they work with the paperwork, but those people cannot review the documents, they cannot make decisions on those documents, they basically just fill up all that application, like they just put the information in, okay? We call them underwriters, a lot of underwriters are unlicensed, they just put the plug in the information in, that's it. And that information has to be overviewed by the mortgage brokers, okay? Perform accounting or bookkeeping services, because of course none of us want to do that. I right? prepare the documentation uh, for the broker uh, to execute with the clients, provided that the documentation will be reviewed by you, by the mortgage broker. So she cannot review them, but she can prepare the documents for you. So remember the rule is, <laughs> she cannot talk. And if she does talk, and if she puts you in trouble, would you be in trouble, yes or no? Yes, you are, because you will be liable for all of her actions. So whatever she does, or if she talks, or if she gives any wrong information to anyone, that's it, you are in trouble, and you can lose your license that way. So what she cannot do is anything here, <laughs> All right? So certain marketing activities or solicit mortgage business from the public or other related industries, it's too much talking in here. Uh, if it's limited to just cold calling thing, remember we talked about that, that's okay. Provide mortgage advices, advice, that means talking. She can do that. Review and explain, explanation, zip zip, All right? Review, she's not capable because she doesn't have a license for that. Negotiate, that's talking again, that's not possible. Ac accepting mortgage applications from the borrowers, no, that's too much of obligation. Communicate with the lenders, no, that's your job, you're not allowed to do such a thing. Uh, determine what documentation is required, she cannot determine, okay? She can prepare them for you and you tell her what documentation is required. Review and vet a borrower's qualification. So it's not her job to vet or review anyone. It's your job. And she's just gonna fill up that information for you. Okay? <laughs> Let's do a question. Question nine. Which of the following is an activity that is unlicensed assistant can perform while under the supervision of the registered broker? So what can she, what can she do? I want you to read all four options by yourself and you tell me which one is the better option here. Option four, is it in or is it out? Can she do this? Determine which one is required. Uh -uh. Too much of responsibility, that's your job. So that's not the one. Accepting mortgage applications, she cannot do any of that stuff. Soliciting, remember we talked, it's a bit too much. But the preparation, hopefully that's the option you chose because she can prepare and you will review that after she's done, right? So option three should be the answer. My clicker doesn't like me today. Okay, so preparing the documentation for you to review, right? So you will review that documentation. Now, so we talked about sub-mortgage broker, we talked about a mortgage broker, right? We talked about the designated agent, and then there's one more role that you can put yourself into, which I don't know anybody who's doing this. <laughs> None of my friends do that, but you could uh, decide to become a mortgage administrator. Now, what's this? What is this role is about? Now, this is where you want to act... Um, you know how in real estate we have rental property management people? Somebody who, let's say you have a property to rent and you don't want to do it yourself and you call them and say, can you rent it for me? And they deal with those tenants, they pick the tenants, they collect the money from the tenants and then they kind of in between you and them so you don't have to deal with that, 
okay? So that's what the mortgage administrator does, but he does it with mortgages. So instead of the lender getting the payments from the borrower, it's this administrator who will be working in between those two parties, okay? So think of that. So a mortgage broker who collects the mortgage payments and forwards them to the lender, right? So he's right in between, uh, just like a rental property management guy. So whatever that um, responsibilities you decide to put on your shoulders as the administrator, you'd better put them all in writing. So it must be in writing. It must be expressed in a contract, in the agreement between you and the lender, what you will be performing, what are the jobs that you can do to help him out. Usually we'll do that maybe for some private lenders. I'm sure the banks will not hire you for this, but the private lenders might say, look, I don't want to deal with borrowers. Can you just deal with them? And he said, okay, pay me a fee and I'll be, I'll be your man. <laughs> so you see how it says may, 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 because it depends what you all, uh, will add to that agreement as a responsibility of yourself. So you may receive mortgage payments, that could be one of them, from the borrower and then send them to the lender. You may enforce the mortgage payments. So if they don't want to pay, then you'd better go after the tenant, not tenant, the, the borrower and ask for those payments from them. May commence the enforcement proceeding. So that's where if they default and they stop paying you those mortgage payments, you'll come after them and you'll take them through court and all the things. You see what I mean? Like that's a lot of responsibilities. Okay, it may discharge the mortgage, so you'll help them to pay it off. So when discharge means pay off, uh, do the paperwork, make sure that it's all good. May collect the money under the mortgage. So there's so many things that you can add as a responsibility as a mortgage administrator. Okay, but that's again, that's your option. I'm sure you're not going to do that in the first years of your new business. <laughs> So finally, let's talk about who is your boss. Do you like my picture? <laughs> so who do you think behind that guy? Do you recognize this? He has blood on his shirt. <laughs> so who is your true boss in this business? Yeah, you got it. Godfather. <laughs> Kind of like a godfather, okay? So that's how, how powerful your boss is, right? So the boss for you guys, his name is Registrar, right? We talked about him before. And he's kind of those little, I don't want to say mean ones, but he's pretty powerful. He's kind of like that guy, okay? So first of all, the Registrar is responsible for what? You remember the Mortgage Brokers Act, all the rules and regulations under the act, it says that the register is the one that will be enforcing the act on mortgage people, right? So he's the one in charge of the act and says, look, the act, right? The act told me that I have to enforce those rules and regulation on you, right? So he's the one that will be enforcing those, the act on you, right? And come off to you. So, but this is a smart boss, right? Register, he says, I don't want to do things myself. You know, I'm a smart, a smart one. So I will delegate my responsibilities to a, a, an independent um, agency who will deal with all, everything, everything, everything. Registrations and dealing with you guys, everything. Okay, so he delegated his duties to uh, BCFSA. You'll hear this a lot. You'll deal with this a lot. Uh, this is going to be your authority that gives you um, the license. You'll, you'll be just dealing with the BCFSA because register doesn't want to deal with you, okay? He delegates all the duties to this financial services authority. So BCFSA is the uh, British Columbia Financial Services Authority. FSA, FSA, think of it as FSA. It is, uh, so this authority regulates and oversees important financial transactions in British Columbia to ensure the fairness legality and prosperity of the consumers and the, uh, in the province. So my question is, who do you think this BCFSA protects again? Okay, Ag protects the public. <laughs> Register is, I don't know, we'll talk about him in a minute right now, but BCFSA, who do, they think, who do you think they protect? Who do they care about? It's always about the public, okay? I'm sorry, but there's nobody there to protect you. <laughs> Right? So BCFSA is the independent agency of the provincial government. So that means different provinces will have different authority bodies in there, but we have BCFSA that responsible for you guys, right? They're not just working for register. 
Hey, this is not one of the, it's independent agency. And they work with credit unions. They work with the real estate boards. So they work with real estate agents, banks, credit unions. There's so many different things they work with. So for that reason, look at this one. They are not created by Mortgage Brokers Act. Okay, because it's independent agency that register decides to hire to help him to do all the duties. Is, is that good? Okay, because as long as you know, because that's what they will put on the exam for you. Separate. And then they will ask you what type. Is that a federal? Is that a provincial? Everything is provincial. Every province has its own rules and regulation stuff. Performs the duties of the registrar. And as I said, it helps all different entities right trust companies credit unions insurances real estate right companies and governs the registration of the mortgage and some mortgage brokers so basically after you pass the exam <laughs> uh, we will help you we'll set you up on part number three where after you pass the exam we'll give you all the steps what needs to be done right so you're not lost you organize we'll give you even uh brokerages that we trust and we like uh, disclosure we don't get paid for many of them we don't we just want to help you guys that's that's kind of our main thing right so after you pass the exam we want to make sure that you're successful but after you've done this on part three you will see that you will send you to this bcfsa website where you're going to be um, submitting your application form so everything done online now through those guys right and then you will take that to your brokerage and then they will finish everything else now Another important thing about this BCFSA thing that they are responsible to provide you with forms. So you're going to have a conflict of interest forms and disclosure forms and all the other forms that you use. Those forms that BCFSA gives you, they are prescribed. You know what it means? It means that form is not changeable. Okay, so that means if they and they must be done like so whatever they tell you to do, whatever is on that form, it has to be filled out. You can't just keep things. You cannot change and alter those forms. And that's what they mean by prescribed form. Okay, very crucial thing because they are responsible for this. Okay, um, let's go back to register. Come on. <laughs> okay, so the register, right? So that's your registration body. He gave all these duties to the uh, BCFSA, Financial Service Authority. So what are those duties? We'll talk about the duties. There's quite a bit of them. First of all, they're responsible for your registration. Think of it as a boss boss. What can the boss do? Can they hire you? Yes, they can. Can they fire you? Yes, they can. Can they penalize you? Yes, they can. They can do everything. <laughs> right? So now it's BCFSA who does all those things. So they grant the registration, renewal, or refusal. That's it. Hey, they can investigate breach under the mortgage brokers act and the criminal fraud so they can do all the investigations and those investigations are they voluntary can they pick and choose and says oh i i i think i want to investigate this one but that one ah forget about that investigation i don't want to do that one today <laughs> no they must investigate so if something comes up right um on their on their table they have to investigate everything attach conditions and restrictions to the registration refusal right so that's what they can do they can put restrictions on your license they can refuse to give you a license they can inspect the books of all of the accounts so they can go to your brokerage i'll say again they go to your not your personal house they'll go to the brokerage and they can walk into the brokerage enter the brokerage offices and they can inspect they can seize any relevant information, right? They can freeze the trust accounts if the brokerage has those ones and they can take your license away, right? So they can do a lot of things. And that's why I said that is a powerful boss. He can even, even, where's the criminal thing in here? They can even imprison you. I don't know if it's here. Oh yeah, we'll get to that slide, but they can do a lot of things in there. Now, this is crucial. It's right at the bottom though, but it says that if somebody sues you, if they take you to court, they can never take you to Supreme Court of um, BC, right? So it's not a Supreme Court that you're dealing with. It's going to be the Financial Services Tribunal. Highlight that word tribunal, right? Financial Services Tribunal. That's a crucial one because that's the one that they will be taking you, right? Mortgage people go through that tribunal court. So let's see what you can do, what they can do to you, right? So if you breach the mortgage, so if you breach the act, Okay, now this is where your boss gets pissed at you and he says, that's it. <laughs> uh, 
What he can do, as I said, he can suspend or cancel your license, right? He can ask you to pay the fine. You remember the fines, the pretty big ones, uh, especially if you don't have a mortgage license. Oof, they'll come after you. They can imprison you. This boss is a powerful one, and real estate boss is not like that. <laughs> There's nothing even close to this, but for you guys, because you're dealing with mortgages and frauds and money, that's huge, right? So he can do a lot of things. The wrong party may file a civil suit against the broker. So that means, remember, your brokerage is responsible for you. They are the umbrella. So if they sue you, that means they sue in the whole brokerage and they will go to court with you. That designated agent will be responsible for your actions. The bond may be required from each broker involved. So money, money, money. This is a crucial one too. Uh, it says the register has the power to order a person who has breached the act to pay an administrative penalty. So when they're referring to administrative penalty, it's up to $50,000. So when you're licensed, that's your penalty, okay? Um, that's the one that they like on the exam a lot. So make sure that you know it's up to $50,000 if you breach any of those mortgage broker act sections, you might be in trouble. <laughs> okay, next one, true or false? Question number 10, the register has the right to seize the personal assets of the broker. Can they do that? The register has the right to seize the personal assets. Can they come have their personal stuff? No, that's too much. They can go to the brokerage, right? To the office, they can seize the documents, but they cannot come after your personal stuff. I say, oh, nice car, we'll seize that one. <laughs> no, not possible, not yet. Question, let's stay there. Let's go for question 11. Okay, which of the following statements is true about the powers pre, um, possessed by the register? So you remember powers of the boss? They're pretty big. Look at option one, tell me if that's true or false. The registrar may, but does not have to, investigate a matter of response uh, to the complaint. Okay, true or false, option one. May, but does not have to investigate. <laughs> Remember what I told you? He must to investigate. So for that reason, that is a false statement because that part itself makes it false, right? May does not, good look, does not look good here. It has to be a must, right? He has no option which case he wants to investigate, which one not. <laughs> okay, option two. The registrar's powers of investigation are limited in scope and do not permit the registrar to enter the brokerage's offices. Okay, true or false? Okay, good job. You said it's a false statement. Why? Because he can enter the brokerage's offices and what's the other thing that is false? Limited. He's not limited. This is the boss that doesn't have many limitations, right? Godfather doesn't have much limitations there. <laughs> okay, option three. The person affected by the decision of the register may appeal that decision of the British Columbia Financial Services Authority. Financial Services Authority, is that where we appeal things to? So put that on the question mark. So that's what you're gonna do in the exam if you're not sure about something. Look at option four, section eight of the Mortgage Brokers Act. Don't worry about the section part, okay? grants the register the power to make an order to suspend or even cancel the disciplined individual registrations where it's appropriate. Now that's definitely a true statement because your boss can take your license away from you, right? So that's definitely a full, uh, sort of true statement. That's what they want. But what's the problem with option number three? Look back at your notes. It's not a Supreme Court that they take you to, but what keyword did I ask you to highlight? It's a financial services tribunal, not a financial services authority. You see how similar that is, but be very, very careful and stuff like that. So always choose which one is a better option, right? That's what they do. They always give you two good options and two easy ones. So in this case, those ones are the tricky ones. Okay, one more question, stay there. Look at question 12. The registrar of the mortgage brokers has the power to order that a person may an administrative penalty up to what? What's the maximum when it comes to administrative penalty? Okay, good job, 50,000, that's good. Okay, one more. Question 13, 
which uh, oh, sorry who is responsible for ensuring that the mortgage brokers meet the requirements of the mortgage brokers act so who is responsible that you follow the act you remember the act good job it's the register is who is responsible for enforcing that act on you <laughs> Okay, so far we learned so many different organizations and probably your head is maybe spinning now, but that's okay. So maybe go through this video one more time, maybe watch Melanie's video too. Whatever helps you to understand, but just know you are just starting doing the law. And when you're just starting doing the law, there's a lot of information cut off packs in the beginning, but then every class will come back to this Consumer Protection Act. We're going to talk about that BCFSA again and again and again. So right now, all these chapters are foundational and it sounds like it's a lot of information, but then we're going to repeat ourselves over and over in all the other chapters too. So don't worry about it too much. Okay, so BC, um, Business Practice Consumer Protection Act. Okay, so this is another act that protects who? <laughs> Who do you think they protect? Do they protect mortgage brokers or do they protect the public? Of course they protect the consumers. Of course they protect the public. Like who is going to protect you? Nobody. <laughs> okay, maybe hire your own private, I don't know, <laughs> somebody to protect you. So anyways, Consumer Protection Act. It's for the protection of the consumers, okay? The next slide I'm going to show you, that's just an examples. You don't have them on your notes, but just know what can they protect you against, uh, like against what. Um, next chapter is coming up. We're going to talk about when you feel like your mortgage rates are too harsh and too unreasonable. Okay, can they protect you from that? Yes, they can. They can even open the case and look and see why is it too harsh? Why is it unreasonable? Does everybody else pay less, way less than you? And if yes, then they can actually change things for you, okay? They can also help you if you feel like you are under pressure to sign something, right? So undo, undo pressure on the consumer to enter into the transaction, right? So if you say, oh, I did it against my own will, so guess what? That could be brought up to the Consumer Protection Act and they will they will change that, right? Consumer who is taken advantage of. So if you feel it's because of your age, maybe because you did not understand what was in the contract, maybe you were literate, maybe whatever that is, but if you feel like they took advantage of you in some way, shape or form, then you can um, apply to the Consumer Protection Act to open up the case for you, okay? Transaction price was far out of the line uh, of what the other consumers are paying. So if they overcharge you way more than what you thought they should be charging you, then Consumer Protection Act will protect you. There was no responsible, um, sorry, no reasonable probability that the consumer would be able to pay the full transaction price. So if you got into the contract that the price is way more than what you can afford, then maybe they'll help you out. I'm not sure how, but maybe. Terms and conditions of the transactions were so harsh and unreasonable. Do you see where they're coming from? Harsh and reasonable, harsh and reasonable. And that's what the Consumer Protection Act is for. Okay, so this question I want you to look at, this is uh, question 14, okay? And I just want to hear your opinion first. What do you think is the primary purpose of the Business Practice and Consumer Protection Act? Okay. What do you think is the purpose? So what do you think? So option one, it says protect consumers from the high mortgage interest rates. Now in 18, oh, sorry, in 1982, okay, to 1984, we're gonna talk about this in the math chapters, but we're gonna talk about how the rates went up to 21%, okay? <laughs> Suddenly all the banks start charging that. Can you apply to the Consumer Protection Act says, look, the rates are way too high. If everybody's charging the same rates, then that's inflation, right? Whatever that is, you can you can do it. So it's not about the high mortgage rates. If it's unreasonable and it's too harsh compared to everybody else's, then it's a different story. But that's not the primary purpose, right? Uh, <clears throat> criminalize unethical behavior. So do you think they're here to criminalize you for unethical behavior? No. We'll talk about ethics in a different chapter, but criminal offense is totally different from ethic. Okay, so option two is out. Protect consumers from the unconscionable acts of practice, unconscionable 
could be unethical or the wrong acts of practice and option four educate mortgage brokers on what behaviors is appropriate so they're not here to educate okay but option three is what they want and i hope that's what you chose right okay? option three because they want to make sure that they protect you from something that is remember harsh unreasonable something that is unethical something that is wrong right unconscionable acts right of practice that's what they aiming for and that's what they're here for so how do you uh deceive people like deceptive and unconscionable acts right so let's talk about that for a minute so let me give you an example so you understand what is deceptive and what is unconscionable here so deceptive could be you as a mortgage broker says you know what if you go through me i have the best connections for you right? the best lenders they give me the best rates and they give me best 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 right so you promote yourself that way but in reality it's not true you have no connections and you have no best rates for your clients right it's the same as everybody else now that is deceptive that's kind of a lie right and you're going to be in trouble for doing that okay the other example is the lender who is saying that look uh flexible mortgage rates or flexible this and that or whatever that they they give you the things but then they don't disclose that they will be charging you extra fees for something or something and you know they, they don't it's deceptive you know they, they give you one uh perspective like the, the way you look at it is one way but then in reality is not as good as what they said right that's kind of what i'm going towards right deceptive and unconscionable as i said is something unethical something that um it's it's done in the wrong way and we'll get through this so basically they're saying that it happened in every single way possible it can happen orally when somebody just speaks to you or you speak to your client right and tell them about all those things it could be visually when you see it in the newspaper right like some I don't know on, on TV or whatever social media or the written statement. So it can happen in every single form possible. And both acts may occur before, during and after the transaction. That's crucial. You have to know that it can happen any any time, right? Um because the newspaper first it gets printed and only then you can see it, right? So it doesn't happen before. It can happen during and after of the transaction itself, right? The important part about this that this deceptive and unconscionable acts apply only to consumer transactions so anything to do with your customers for uh primarily how like primarily um for their personal use basically right so it's for it's not for the commercial it's not for the investors it's not for the lenders so consumer protection act protects people regular people who wants to get mortgages for personal use right not commercial but for the personal like where they're going to be living basically okay so what happens if any of those acts happens hey right? the courts has the power to do what they can close the whole transaction they can do that right set aside all the part of the mortgage transaction and they can tell the lender to uh repay any of those money that they received from the uh from the borrower before and just just close everything and say goodbye to everyone they right? suspend the rights of the obligation uh, obligation of all of the parties so they can just cancel the whole thing that's it so disclosure requirements it's a very big part of this chapter because for the exams Again, I want to make sure that you know how to think. Right? Not just knowing the information is not enough, but what do they want to hear from you on the exam? Okay, you have to think how they want you to think. And when I say disclose, should you disclose some information to your clients? Okay, if you get the commissions or if something comes to you, if somebody gave you a gift, all of those things should you disclose it to the client that you're working with, right? The lender and the borrower. And please say yes, because on the exam, that's one of the things that tests you guys over and over and over. Make sure that you understand that you are here not for your personal benefits, you're here for your clients. Hey, okay? that's your job to make sure that they are satisfied and make sure that you don't hide anything from them. Right? So under the BCPC, BCPA, I call it CPA because Consumer Protection Act, right? Business Practice and Consumer Protection Act requires that the disclosure be given to by the mortgage brokers right, to the individuals who borrow for the primarily personal, family, or household purposes. So what I remember what I told you, it only applies cons to consumer transactions. Right? That's what they mean, right? For the primary personal, family, household purposes. And this is where they protect you, and this is where 
you have to give that disclosure to the borrowers and the lenders in this transaction, regardless where you're making, um, where the broker or lender is charging additional fees or expenses. So basically, in any transaction that you create for the consumer transactions, you have to disclose them about everything. And we'll talk about what you have to disclose. Who is not protected under the CPA, right? Who is not protected? What did I say? Commercial transactions are not protected, right? Lenders are not protected. Institutional investors are not protected, right? None of that protected only for personal primary use of your clients. So what type of disclosure you have to give them? The one that you will be dealing a lot with in every single transaction, it will be the cost of credit form. Now, this cost of credit form will not be tested on the exam. I don't know why, but it's not there. But just know that this is the form under the BPCPA, right? Consumer Protection Act. And what needs to be included in that form is all of the disclosures. Disclosure statements, notice of the statement of the accounts, and the most important part is that APR. Now, what is an APR? APR is the annual percentage rate. So you know how you go to the bank and they say, so what's the rate you're going to give me? And they'll say, oh, we'll give you this much. APR is the whole rate for the whole year that has to be expressed as an annual rate. Rate of interest must be expressed as an annual um, percentage uh, rate uh, on the disclosure statements. That's it. That's the rule. And it's done by that BC, BPCPA, right? They tell you that's what you have to disclose in here. And when do you have to disclose to the buyers all those things, to the borrowers? You have to disclose that two days prior to the borrowers getting the money, right? So before the closing of the transaction, two days minimum, right? Before that, you have to disclose that. Or if they are on the floating rates, then it has to be every once every 12 months. So every year, you have to give them that disclosure statements of the APR. Tell them how much, right? So again, back to that form. This is the form. I will attach them to the videos on the like under the videos down there for you guys, so you can look at them. Okay, nobody's gonna test you on those forms, but if you just want to see how they look like, very complicated form. This form is not prescribed, so that means a Consumer Protection Act doesn't give you specific forms that you have to follow, but it's easier if you just use the form that's given to you, right? But that's the form you can add it, you can do, you can add your own things. Now, this is the form that in real life you will be using quite a lot because um, um, it's called, we have the FinTrack, right? Where you have to provide the identification of your clients, make sure that you know who you're dealing with, and that's one of the forms they will ask you for. Anyways, back to the point. The CPA, BPCPA does not contain prescribed disclosure form. What I say, that form is mandatory, but it's not in a specific form. So that means you can change things in there, okay? Add things in there, remove things in there. It's not advised, but you can do this stuff. Okay. You remember who is BCFSA? Do you remember that? <laughs> it's your... Uh, oh my gosh, sorry, <laughs> brain freeze. Okay, it's the British Columbia Financial Services Authority. So this is the is where the register pushed all his duties to them and it says you, you deal with all the forms, you deal with the registration, you deal with everything else. Independent agency of the provincial government, right? Duties of the register, works for a lot of different things, governs the registrations of yours, right? So they're the one who is responsible for to go through your forms but they, their forms are prescribed. So this is where they will tell you, you have to use specific form and that form is not changeable, okay? You can't do nothing in that form. Again, as I said, they are not created by Mortgage Brokers Act, they are just acting on behalf of the register, right? He hired them. So this is the two forms that they want you to know on the exam. And those forms are prescribed or not prescribed. If they are, Created by BCFSA, that means they are prescribed. That means you have to be as what's given to you. Form 9, <laughs> it's so funny. You talk to mortgage people and it says, what's Form 9? I've never seen the Form 9. And guess what? You will never use Form 9 in the first two, three years of your, um, of your business. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> um, so the Form 9 is a disclosure to the lenders. Right? So this is where you have to tell the lenders. I'll, I'll tell you what, but... 
Um, so first of all, those forms, both forms are prescribed by BCFSA, okay? Mortgage brokers must retain those copies for at least seven years. And I'll tell you how you have to keep them and which way, okay? And each of those forms will have a disclosure statement saying that the registrar is not responsible for any of that information that's included in those forms. That's kind of what that is, right? So it's funny disclosure statement and every single form that you look at, you'll find a disclosure saying that the registrar has no approved the information statements of the mortgage brokers in any way, shape or form. That's it. He just doesn't want to be responsible for you, for your forms. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about this Form 9. So Form 9 is the one that you probably will never use, especially in the beginning. Sometimes, it's very rarely people use this form. So this is the form that's given usually only to private lenders. First, I'm going to explain you who do you give it to and why we never use it. Uh, on your application, when you're going to choose the option as a sub-mortgage broker in the beginning, Okay. There's going to be a little check marks in there. Do you want to be a broker providing funds or dealing with the bro um, broker lending funds? Yeah, yeah. So there's going to be a little check marks in there. And most of us will not check on that because we don't want to deal with that. Hey, there's a lot of work in there involved and we just don't have those private lenders as much. But anyway, so some of you guys might decide to do this. And let's say if one of your buddies, your friends or your relatives have a lot of money, and they're not sure what to do with the money and they want to just um, start lending people money towards the mortgages, then you can help them with that transaction. And you will provide this form nine to that, um, to your friend, right? Because he becomes a lender now. He's an investor who's investing money into the mortgages. But remember the rule is, as long as your friend does less than how many transactions per year? Less than 10. Because if it's ten or more, then, then he has to have his mortgage license and do what you do right now, okay? But the point is, that's why you don't use it too often because that's the only time that you will use the Form 9 is for those private lenders who is giving those mortgages um, to people, right? Because they don't know much. Um, they're not educated enough about mortgages, let's say that way. So that's why you have to provide them with that form. But everybody else on the list will be exempt. And that's why we don't ever provide the Form 9 to any other lenders because they are sophisticated persons. That's how they call them on the exam. We have students coming back from the exams and they saw the questions about the sophisticated people, who they are on the list. Just remember who are not sophisticated. Who is not sophisticated is the private lenders because they don't have enough knowledge and information behind their back. Okay? They cannot do investigation on their, on their back by themselves. Right? For that reason, they are not sophisticated. Not because they're not smart, but because they just don't have that knowledge behind their back. Right? So if they are sophisticated lenders, then we don't give them that disclosure nine. And most of them are, all of them are uh, on that list. Right? So the list is huge. If you open the UBC books and look through the sophisticated people, which you're welcome to if you want to, it's going to be pretty much everyone except those private lenders. Okay, so when they give you that question in the exam, just know the exception who is not a sophisticated land, uh, uh, person and, and then you're going to be okay. So you don't have to give this form to sophisticated people. Who is sophisticated? Anyone who works for the government, municipal corporation, uh, somebody who is a saving institution, who is insurance or trust company. Okay, uh, mortgage broker acting as a principal, so you're giving your own money to somebody else, right? A personal registered, um, person registered under the Securities Act. That's just an example that they like a lot on the exam. But as I said, there's a huge list of sophisticated people. Um, you can read them all or you just know one exception, right? Private lenders or not. So Form 9 required in a transaction in which the mortgage broker is so what you do, right? Arrange the mortgage for the lender in return for the commission. Arranges the sale of lender's interest in the mortgage in return for the commission. Okay, sells the mortgage broker's own interest as a lender in the mortgage uh, to a third party. So pretty much in any of when you arrange a mortgage um, for the lender, right? In return for the commission, but those lenders, it has to be a as I said, a private lender for this form to be <clears throat> valid because sophisticated people will be exempt from this Form 9. 
Written disclosure statements. So that's something that has to be done with this form. We have to be everything in writing must be given to the lender investor before any money is advanced or before the funds are released. Because if you don't provide them with that disclosure statements, if you don't give them that form, they don't have to release the funds. They can just cancel on you, right? Um, and upon the mortgage renewal, same thing. You have to give them that form once again. What did I say about the funds, uh, about the paperwork? You have to keep that um, in the secure place, which we'll talk about for at least seven years. So that's it. That's about the form nine. Let's talk about the form 10. This is the form you're going to deal a lot in every single transaction. You will work with this conflict of interest form. This is a must form for you to give to your client. Um, and this form will be given to the lenders and it will be given to the borrowers. Do you see what I mean? Like this is the form that will be given on two sides. So the conflict of interest, um, the act places the equal obligations to provide the conflict of interest disclosure from both a mortgage broker, which is your brokerage and from the sub mortgage broker. So both of you guys are responsible for that form and you're responsible to disclose in that form, both direct and indirect interest. Okay. So what is this direct and what is indirect interest? I, I kind of like to keep it simple. Direct is pretty much everything that visible, something that comes up out of this transaction. And it makes sense like your commissions, bonuses, fees, whatever that is, comes up in here. Um, even like uh, rewards points, because that's something that you want to disclose to your clients. And when you disclose that information to your clients, you will disclose the same identical information to the lenders and the borrowers. So if it's in the same transaction, you will give the same disclosure statements to both of them. And it has to be identical. You can't pick and choose who sees what, okay? They both have to see that because you want to make sure that you uh, don't create a conflict of interest. Make sure that you disclose everything that you know, okay? Mortgage broker or family member is a lender. So if you have somebody who's dealing who is a member or somebody that's your relative, or if it's you who's lending the money, all that is a conflict of interest and it must be disclosed to the clients right? and the lenders. A uh, family member or business partner of the mortgage broker is a borrower. Right? Um, so again, if you're dealing with family members, um, then you have to tell the lender, that's my family that I'm getting the mortgage for. Mortgage broker receives a, f a fee from the borrower. Right? or a gift even, right? So if you receive anything, you have to disclose everything on those forms and it has to be provided to both of them, right? Lenders and the borrowers. Now the indirect interest is something that is not really visible. Something that might happen even in the future, not even now, because a lot of times, I don't know if you guys know, but you guys are in the best business. <laughs> First of all, your clients never ask for your commissions back. They only say thank you for getting them a mortgage. Um, they also, a lot of them, when you get them approval on a mortgage, because in Canada we have terms, right? Two years, three years, five years. And after the term is finished, you always have to refinance your client and get them a new, um, new finance. And then every time you refinance them, you, uh, if, if they stay with the same lender, you're automatically getting paid for that. Did you know that? It's kind of nice. So that's called the trailing fees, right? So that's something in the future that will be, you know, like just because they decided to stay with the same lender, you're automatically getting your commissions. And that is indirect because it's in the future, something that it's not really visible at this point, right? But you have to also disclose that on this conflict of interest form. So you have to let them know upfront basically, right? And if you have any designation with the lender, so if you have some preferences with that lender, you have to disclose this. So this question, just to let you know, is not on your notes. That's just an example. I just wanted to, to give it to you and see what kind of answer you would give me back. So what do you think needs to be disclosed on the form 10? Angela, she's a sub mortgage broker. She's working with Frank, who is a borrower. She's trying to get him financing. Okay. And Angela usually submits a lot of her applications through the lender a and the reason she does it because lender a likes to give her bonuses he likes to provide her with the reward points on every mortgage funded and those points can go towards the 
um, to buy items such as electronics or airline tickets. So she's really happy with this lender A. And she also works with the lender B, uh, who does not provide her with any of those bonuses. There's nothing comes from him. So what do you think I'm going with the story? <laughs> So now she only chooses to submit her mortgage application through the lender A. So she does not submit that application through the lender B. For whose, is she working on the best interest for her client right now? Is she thinking of her client or is she thinking of herself more? Do you see the problem? Please don't do that in real life. Okay, always think of the, on behalf of your client, what's better for them. But anyways, but the lender A says, look, we'll approve him. We'll give him the will give him the, the mortgage and because he get, she got approval from the lender A, uh, she receives her um, points and then she bought her laptop. So what does she have to disclose on form 10? Okay, commissions. Does she have to let Frank to know how much commission does she make from the lender A? Yes, she does, okay? How about the reward points? Does she have to let him know about those reward points? Yes, she does. We'll say yes. And then the last one, approximate dollar value of the rewards points. So she needs to put those reward points in the dollar value on her application to show that how much money she's making from those bonus points. It's also true. So it should be all of the above in here. But again, that's just an example just to show you that you have to disclose everything, everything, everything that comes up out of the transaction. So this question, you have it on your notes, question 15. Let's do this one. A mortgage broker is required to disclose to the borrowers and lenders any direct or indirect interest that they may have in the mortgage transaction. Which of the following is an example of the indirect? Now, what's indirect? Something could be in the future, something that is not visible at this point, right? So why don't you read through these options and you tell me which one is indirect? Commissions, option one, commissions. The lender pays the base commissions. Now that's definitely direct because it's visible, it's understandable, it's gonna happen in the present. That's not indirect, that's direct. Option two, the borrower pays fees. Fees is direct, it's visible, right? So not that one. The lender pays fees to the mortgage broker in order to, the consider, uh, to be considered as a preferred lender. So hey, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pay fees right now if you just add me to your preferred lender list and now you send me more, most of your clients. You got the point, right? And option four, the borrower is the mother of the mortgage broker. So that's direct because it's visible and you have to disclose this. But this preferred lender list is where this, this is where it becomes more indirect because it's not really visible, if that makes sense, right? So yeah, you, you'll get used to it. The more questions you do, the better you're going to get at this stuff. <clears throat> okay. So, um, where are we? Okay, so we talked about this, right? The indirect. Now, must be provided to each person to who is the borrower or the lender in the transaction. Remember what I tell you? And that information that you're going to give them will be identical. So, lenders and the borrowers will get the same, same information in here. Identical regardless of the recipient and must be signed. If you do not sign this conflict of interest form by the lenders and by the borrowers, you will be in trouble. Okay, and acknowledgement receipt has to be given to them too. So you need to make sure that it's signed because if it's not signed, then they can blame back and, oh, you never told me that you got this and that, right? And then you, yeah, you don't need that. <laughs> you definitely don't need this. Okay, when the form uh, 10 has to be provided to the borrower, what do you think? How soon should you give that form 10 disclosure of conflict and interest to them? Okay, it has to be uh, at the earliest opportunity that you have before they sign the mortgage transaction, before they get the funds, okay? But the earliest opportunity, on the exam, sometimes they'll say, does it have to be two days before? Does it have to be this and that? There's no specific timing for these forms, but as long as it's done before the transaction is closed, okay? And when it comes to lender, how soon do you provide it to the lender? It could be before or it could be on the same day of the release of the funds advanced, right? So that's the only difference that it could be done on the day of the funds advanced. Okay, question 16. Conflict of interest disclosure is not required to be made to the borrower by the mortgage broker arranging the mortgage for that borrower is the lender is providing only non-monetary compensation to the mortgage broker, such as free gifts. Um, 
so what they're trying to say is <laughs> you don't have to put their gifts on your disclosure forms. You don't need to do disclosure because of that. Do you? Of course you do. You have to give them everything. So that is a false statement because you have to disclose them. Everything, everything comes out of the transaction. And something that might be even happen in the future, right? Like trailer fee. Question 17. In which of the following situation would be a submortgage broker likely not be obligated to disclose a conflict of interest? Okay. So we talked about the conflict of interest and we say that it's pretty much happens all the time and you have to give it to everybody. So what could be an exemption to that? Who doesn't need to receive that form of conflict of interest? Look at option one. A sub mortgage broker arranges a mortgage for a borrower. The lender is in transaction as a broker's father. So if it's your father who gives the money to the borrower, should you let them know it's my father's money? Of course you do, definitely. Otherwise, it's going to be a conflict of interest. So that's definitely not the answer, okay? Because um, you have to give them disclosure. Option two, sub mortgage broker hire. Uh, no, sub mortgage broker herself is the lender. So if you are the lender yourself and you have money, do you have to let the borrower know? It's my money that I'm borrowing to you. <laughs> yes, you do. Definitely you have to give the form. They ask you which, which one is not the one, okay? Option three, sub mortgage broker arranges a mortgage for the borrower who has agreed to purchase a property that is sub mortgage broker in his uh, capacity as a real estate trading services licensee is listing. Holy shit. So what they try to say here, <laughs> sorry, uh, what they try to say here is a mortgage broker also has a real estate license and he has a, um, a listing, that's his listing that the buyer wants to buy. And she said, look, if you buy my listing, I also can help you with uh, providing you a mortgage. So she's doing... She's gonna get commission on two sides. Does she need to let the borrower know about this? That she, that's her listing and she's gonna make commission from the listing and she's gonna make commission from him getting the mortgage. Please say yes, it's definitely. So all of the three so far, they need to have that form 10 provided to them. They have to disclose everything. And the last one, the property for which the sub mortgage broker arranges a mortgage is adjacent to his own home. Okay, property for which the sub mortgage broker arranges a mortgage is a genius. So you get in your own mortgage, adding mortgage to your own house. Do you see what happens in here? So do you have to give disclosure to yourself? <laughs> that's the only exception, I guess, is when you give it to yourself, then that's when you don't have to provide the conflict of interest because it's, there's not really conflict of interest. <laughs> it's you to yourself serving it. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Good job, good job. And then a very crucial point is they're going to talk about what happens when you try to mislead someone. Okay, so we're going to talk about the public first and then we'll talk about misleading the lender. Can you mislead the public? Hopefully you said no, <laughs> don't mislead anyone. Under the Act, which is your Mortgage Brokers Act and Rules, right? Uh, don't worry about the section. It says the mortgage brokers or sub-mortgage brokers are prohibited from making any false, misleading or deceptive statements to your clients, right? And you cannot do it through any type of way, shape or form. So when they talk about the advertisement, it could be done orally. You said something to your friend, you said something, to, I don't know, while you were at some party or, and you said some statements in there that are misleading us, are false statements. Could be deceptive ones, right? Um, make sure that in the promotion of their services. So if you try to promote yourself in some way, shape or form, and if you mislead someone, and if you give them that false statements, then you will be in a big trouble. Look at the fine amount. And that's crazy. So the act says the fine will be up to 100,000 and with the subsequent offenses up to 200,000 and or up to two years of imprisonment. So they taking that very, very seriously. So don't try to mislead anyone because if you do that, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble and you don't wanna spend two years in prison because of that, All right? Must publish the name under which they are registered. Remember what I tell you? Because you guys will have to be uh, sub-mortgage brokers in the beginning and that has to be only on the individual name so if it's your personal name then you have to advertise yourself with your personal name in there if you are the mortgage broker which that means you have your brokerage and if you put yourself as a corporation you have to use that corporation name now so choose wisely the names and make sure whatever you put in there whatever you register yourself under 
that's what has to go on the advertisements. Might also include the amortization. So under the act, they say when you advertise the rates or whatever you do, make sure that you add amortization on your advertisement, right? Um, but then the BPCPA, the Consumer Protection Act, they added one more thing. And you that that you must state the APR. The APR is the annual percentage rate. So you have to always show the clients how much interest you will be paying in the full year. So very important information. So they might ask you, what is this misleading public thing is? And they might ask you about this false misleading or deceptive statements, right? They might ask you for the specific words in there. So make sure that you know that, right? And then BCP, uh, Business Practice Consumer Protection Act, they also added to all this that the APR must be disclosed. Now, let's talk about misleading the lenders now. Section 14 of the Act. So the Act says, must not provide the false or misleading information ab about the borrower. So make sure that you never lie about the borrower. So this is crucial. Because if you're going to put some information, oh yeah, my borrower has been working, uh, if you cre create a false statements about the borrowers or you come up with a false um, information about the borrowers, oh yeah, he's been with his job for 20 years, which is false, for example, right? You just lied to make it look better, you're going to lose your license, okay? Duty to ensure the accuracy of the information provided by the applicant and reasonable due diligence must be undertaken to ensure the information passes on the lending community is accurate, not in-depth investigation. So what I mean by this one, you don't need to do in-depth investigation on your clients. You don't have to do investigations, right? It's a bit too much for you, but you can ask for proof. Okay, if you work there for 20 years, can, can you show me some documents, right? Just, just, just put, put it all together. And if something that you're not sure about, and if there's some documents are missing, if you uh, not really sure if he's worked there for let's say 20 years, then you can tell the lender, I am not sure about that information, right? I couldn't confirm on that information from the borrower. So that's all you have to do is just disclose to the lenders as much as you know, there's no specific investigation you have to do. And if there's some documents are missing or something that you cannot um, know yourself, if it's true or false, then you let the lender know. It says, I couldn't um, find any information uh, or statements to prove that information. So I'm not sure about that one, but that's what the borrower says, right? And this way you're taking the, lift, uh, the, the weight off your shoulders, right? You're not responsible anymore. And now the lender knows that that part was not confirmed yet and they'll do, they'll do their own investigations. If the information is not verified, advise the lending institution in writing, right? And that's what they mean. It has to be put in the writing says, hey, I couldn't verify that information, so you know. <laughs> and that's all you have to do, right? Mortgage brokers who has misled a financial institution may be reported to the register of the mortgage broker. So that means that you will be reported to your boss and the boss can cancel your license, suspend your license, freeze you, whatever. They can do a lot of things. Okay, so we have uh, two frauds you also have to know for the exams is the identity fraud and the value fraud. Usually our students see at least one question on this. Pretty straightforward, but you have to know this. These frauds are the criminal offense. Now look, now it's under the criminal code. So it's no more BCFSA, it's no more registered, there's no more Consumer Protection Act. Now this is where the criminal code gets involved. And identity fraud is when somebody creates something to do with the person itself, right? Fake letter of employment. Somebody answers the calls on behalf of their um, employer and says, oh yeah, I'm the boss, let me give you the information, but that's your girlfriend who's <laughs> answering the phone, right? So stuff like this. Fraudulent transfer property title to your name. That's personal fraud. Asking someone you know to act as your employer. So anything you do with the person itself, okay? That will be an identity fraud. The value fraud, it's something to do with the property itself, right? So identity, it's the person fraud. Value fraud is something to do with the property. So what could that be? Right? Uh, artificial inflation of the price of the piece of the property. So that means you're just saying that, oh, I think it's worth that much more, right? 
Um, but I'll show you the examples, the one that you have to know. So first identity, we call them the red flag. So something you have to look for um, in the transaction to see if, if it's a red flag. And if it's a red flag, you have to notify the lender and say, hey lender, there's something fishy with this person, right? Or there's one of the red flags that came up, or more than one. So the client does not provide photo ID upon request. That is a red flag for you, and that is identity fraud because it's something to do with that person itself, okay? Not with the house, not with the property, but with the person, right? If he doesn't provide you ID, a photo ID, that could be an issue, okay? Other offers uh, that are subject to financing that have not gone through, so... He went through other, uh, through other lenders before, but he never got financing, right? So subject financing didn't go through. Could be a red flag. The land title office information is inconsistent with the mortgage application. So uh, if on the title, let's say that person name comes up, not comes up, it comes up somebody else's name, that's inconsistency, right? Like why is the title shows one name and then you have a different name, right? Real estate transaction involves a relative. Now, this is a big one on the exam. They're always asking you about this one. That is a, an identity fraud. So if you involve, um, it, it's just a red flag. So it's not a fraud, but it's, it's a red flag for you. It says, why is the relatives, um, is one of the real estate brokers, right? So somebody's helping out of the relatives. You have to be really careful with that because that could be a conflict of interest. Okay, joint tenants that are not related. So if you pull up the title search and you see that there is a husband and wife, that's okay. But if you see there's completely two different last names or they're not related in any way, shape, or form, that could be a red flag, right? And it's under the personal um, identity fraud. The full name is not disclosed. So that means the buyer, instead of putting in just Preet, he just put Jazz and whatever his last name is, right? Or it doesn't show you the middle names in there. So that could be a red flag. The client's employment report does not match the industry standards. The client has several investment properties, but no primary residence. That could be a red flag. Um, the client's check does not match his or her identity. <laughs> The down payment or deposit is in cash form. Now that is, it's funny, this is what they're looking for, right? They don't like cash anymore for some reason. Um, <laughs> I want to comment, but I don't want to comment. Uh, so if they give you a large cash down payment, more than $10,000, that's when the FinTrack form is going to get involved and this is where it could be an issue, right? Are they just going to say, hey, where's the money coming from? That kind of thing. The person signing the application has been granted power of the attorney by the real um, registered owner. So if you're dealing with the power of the attorney, just watch out. It could be a red flag. Um, appointments are all arranged via cell phone, email. At the meetings are held in a public location. So that means, you know, that person is just not comfortable around you. Involved in other real estate transactions with a high ratio of mortgages before. So... When they say red flags, that means you just have to be aware of them, but it doesn't mean that is a fraud here, <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, on the exam, they do like questions about the red flags, and the red flags usually comes up about the value fraud. So what's the value fraud? Value fraud is something to do with the property fraud, right? So something going on with the land that you don't like, and you have to be really careful to disclose that to the, to the lender. So this is a huge one on the exam. Appraisal is missing or does not make sense. So if there's no appraisal done on the property, guess what? That's, there's no way that the lender will give you money. Appraiser is not an approved list of the appraisers. That's a big one too, right? So appraiser is not, so usually when the lender lends you money, they will give you their own list of the appraisers that they like to use. And if, if that appraiser that your borrower used, it's not on the list, then that will be a red flag and they're actually not gonna approve it. Then they take back mortgages, they don't like it because it's not done through them, it's done directly through the seller of the property, right? That's a red flag for them. Number of the trades in the property in a short period of time. So there's too many transactions going on in the short period of time. In three months, it's sold four times, right? Um, the final purchase price is higher than the listing price. Okay, that's kind of a funny one because when the market is too hot, Yes, we pay more than what it was listed for, but for the exam, that is a red flag. Okay, the final, um, the property contains illegal suites, so just, just be aware of that. 
goods chattels are used as part of the purchase price or deposit. So somebody doesn't have enough money to say, hey, take my car as a down payment. <laughs> Unique uh, commission plans are simply low commission rates. If it's too low, again, it could be a red flag. Why? Vendor buys and sells many properties. I do it. <laughs> uh, one lorry that represents both the purchaser and the vendor, right? That's, that's, where the, like, that's why there's always a conflict of interest. You always want to suggest that they always use different lawyers. Uh, there's an uh, immediate possession date, so there's no time in between the close there are no counter offers and it seems like names have been erased or added to the application right so there's a lot of things in here so just know which one is a value for value to do something with the lens so watch for the top list what i kind of highlighted in here for you because that's what comes up on the exam the most and that's something you need to pay attention to okay i'll show you a question on this so question 18 which of the following are the red flags that the mortgage broker might use to indicate a value fraud? So they were talking about the land fraud, right? The value fraud. And appraisal is missing. Is that one of them? Yes, it is. So we're keeping that one. The real estate transaction involves a relative. So my question, that relative, was that on the land value fraud or are they identity fraud? Okay. Next one. The appraiser is not on the approved list of the appraisers, so that's definitely to do with the land value, right? So value fraud, value fraud, question mark. There are a number of trades of the property in a short period of time. That's also a value fraud. So my only question is about B. Look back at your notes if you need to and see if this one is the identity fraud or is that a value fraud? And based on that, you can choose the answer. Okay, so you found that. So involved the relative that is an identity fraud because that's more person to person, right? It's not, not much to do with the actual transaction of the land. Okay, so for that reason, you would choose A, C, and D because that is an identity fraud. It's not a value fraud. Question 19, which of the following indicates the value fraud? You see what I mean? Questions they like about the value fraud the most on the exam. Tom has created a fake letter of the employment, and I'll stop. Is that to do with the land value or the person? That's with the person, so that's not a value fraud. That's identity fraud. Tom has artificially inflated the price of the property. Is that to do with his personal thing, or is that with the land? Price of the property, that's land, so that's a value fraud for sure. And Tom has arranged his girlfriend to answer her cell phone as his employer. That's personal. So out of those three, do you see the difference? The value to do something with the land itself. So definitely option number two is the answer. Trust funds. Now this is the last part, almost the last part. So some of the mortgage brokers decided to have the trust funds, right? So, and if they do have trust, if they deal with trust funds of their clients, then they have to have a trust account. It's a must for them to have it. And if they receive any money in cash, right? So if there's any transaction cash, they have to make sure that they issue the written receipt for those transactions. And they must ensure that the trust agreements between the mortgage brokers and the clients and the other parties are in writing. And they make sure that they are available every time somebody requests for those forms. Right? Do you see what I mean? Everything has to be in writing. Everything has to be, um, there has to be written receipts in there, right? And available. So that means they cannot put their trust accounts or information far from their office. It has to stay in their office. Now, <clears throat> um, the funds that are paid in trust, the disclosure statements must be given and it has to be given to you prior to the release of the funds from the trust. And when the brokerage has those trust funds, they must to file every single year audited financial statements within 120 days of the end of the brokerage fiscal year, right? So they have to file the report. It's a must for them to do this. And the register, remember what his, the, your boss says? Does he have the power to investigate and walk into their office and seize and freeze all those um, documents and freeze the funds? He has all the rights, right? So he can freeze those trust funds if he finds there's something going on in there. And if he doesn't like it, 
he wants to investigate it, he'll definitely freeze the trust accounts. Okay. Now, what if it's a mortgage broker who doesn't deals with trust funds, right? He doesn't want to deal with money. He doesn't want to hold it for his clients. So if you do not handle the trust funds, then you still have to do a yearly declaration, must file a statutory declaration that you don't hold the money in trust. But if you lie, is that a criminal offense? Yes, it is, right? May face criminal charges if the information is inaccurate, right? So if you lie about it, that you don't hold the uh, trust fund, but you actually do, then that's criminal offense against you. Not fun. <laughs> and the last part, record keeping. So what do we talk about? That you have to keep all the documents for at least seven years. So all of those forms that you collect from every single mortgage transaction, you have to keep them for seven years. Now, where do you keep them? Can you keep it at your mom's house? <laughs> Can you keep them at some third party provider and says, oh, I'll keep the documents for you. Okay, you can do that. It has to be somewhere um, where it's on site or a secure um, offsite storage facility, but it's something that belongs to you. You cannot get into the contract with a third party provider who will keep them for you because what if that person takes off and then you have no way to get those documents anymore? Do you see the point? So, yes, um, you should be keeping those documents close to you, right? Somewhere you can always get them. Uh, it's not on the slide, but I want to ask you how, in which way do you keep those documents? Does it have to be hard copies, all of them? Or can it be just on your computer, you know? <laughs> or should you keep both of them? Of course, for the exam purposes, you want to say keep both of them just because whatever is reachable, whatever is easier for you to get the copy, if the register, if your boss requests them or if your office requests them. So you should keep them in both ways, but as long as it's, you can always uh, retrieve those documents, as long as you can have, um, you can get them back basically fast, right? That's, that's all that matters, but just know that you cannot give it to any other providers. You cannot send them to a different country. <laughs> it, has to be, it has to be available to you as, as soon as the register asks for them. And what can the register do? He has the authority to enter your mortgage broker office, right? To your office, not your personal house. And then he can inspect the books, he can examine things, analyze the records, he can do whatever he wants at that mortgage broker's facility. Okay, so that's it. We finished this chapter. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm so proud of you. You're still here. So uh, take a break and then go through the quizzes. Uh, do it sooner than later and then see what information you remember and which one you still have to brush up on. And I will see you next chapter. Thank you.